fundamental um, pieces of literature, all right? one of the most fundamental pieces of literature in all of Jewish um, thought, in Musar. Okay? Now, this is a letter that was written by Nachmanides, not Maimonides, Maimonides was Rambam. This is written by Ramban. Right, who was who overlapped with Maimonides about about fourteen years. Right, um, Ramban wrote incredibly deep, uh, incredibly deep commentary on the on the Torah, as well as the Talmud, um, and everything that the Ramban did with his unbelievable accomplishments was done in a way a, a very very proper and very um, thoughtful way. He wrote a letter to his son telling him um, telling him how he should conduct his life. Yes. What does uh, Ramban, Ramban mean? Reb Moshe ben Nachman. Okay. Right? So that's... Okay. Okay, so let's begin with the beginning of the letter. Okay. Okay. Shema b'ni Musar avicha ve'alti tosh Torah shemecha. Hear, my son, the instruction of your father, and don't forsake the teaching of your mother. As we know, this is a verse in Proverbs, one eight. It says it right there, right? Mishlei one eight, and in it, what what King Solomon wrote in Proverbs was the secrets of all wisdom. And what he's saying here is that there are different roles that a father and a mother play in a child's life. Father gives structure, right? Gives a certain gives a certain boundaries, but the mother enriches what's in those boundaries. Right? The mother gives uh, lessons, gives teachings, gives morals, gives ethics, gives a lot of a lot of the the I guess would say the nutrients that we need to grow spiritually are given by the mother. But the foundation and the and the parameters are given by the, by the dead, which is why many times the father is the one who who sets the rules, right? We know that when when uh, when a child misbehaves, right, the mother is the one who says, uh, "You wait till your dad gets home," right? <laughs> yeah. Right? It doesn't go the other way around for whatever reason, right? <laughs> Because there is certain certain structure. So what he's saying is here is, listen to the instructions of your father, the guidelines, right? But don't forsake the teachings of your mother. The mother has an unbelievable responsibility to the spirituality of every child. All right? So here's the father giving the instruction. He's writing this letter to his son. He's saying, don't forsake the teachings of your mother, all of the lessons that she's taught you. But I'm going to give you some instruction now. Okay, I'm going to lay down the, 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 the law. Okay. Get into the habit of always speaking calmly to everyone. A person needs to learn to use a calm and pleasant voice, right? With a pleasantness, okay, with a calmness. To everyone, lechol adam uvecholet, at every to every person and at every moment, ubezetin atzel minakas. Right, this will prevent you from anger. That means there's a step that we need to take that will help us eliminate anger. A person gets angry, right? Just a very interesting. Uh, uh, we can do. You can do. I'm sure there's plenty of research done on this. But the tone in which a person speaks will deter- will help determine whether or not, or, or w- it will help determine what the outcome will be. When a person speaks speaks in a strong and assertive voice, they're about to get angry, right? A person speaks in a calm, pleasant voice, even if you know they're irritated, right? There's still there's a certain barrier between that and getting angry. 
What's that? You could do panim shel ka'as. Right. right, so panim shel ka'as means sometimes you give off a front as if you're angry, but you're really calm. An example for that would be um, my, uh, I, there's a story from <coughs> Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, who I've, who I've quoted numerous times <coughs> in his classes, um, he once said, he, there was once a, fanta- a fascinating incident that happened. One of his students there, the way, the way it used to work is in his waiting room, you'd walk, you'd wait, wait in the room, you'd go into his office and you'd go out the other door. So you wouldn't see, mm-hmm. if you were able to overhear a conversation, you wouldn't be able to know who, they were to, who Rav Moshe was talking to. There would be privacy. You'd come in one door, go out the other door. And that way, it would just keep on flowing through. So one time, one of the students walked in and he hears Rav Moshe, the great Torah sage. I mean, this, the unbelievable giant, Torah giant, yelling and screaming on top of his lungs. And everybody knew Rav Moshe was the calmest, most delightful person. Right? He never got angry. And to hear him yell and scream like this was just out of character. So as soon as it was done, a minute later, the next person walks in. And he sees that Rav Moshe is like calm as can be. And he's wondering, like, what just happened here? Right? How can it be that Rav Moshe is so calm when he just was yelling as if he was angry and who knows what? So he asked Rabbi Feinstein, he asked Rav Moshe, he said, Rav Moshe, how is it possible? She so says, are you suspecting that I would get angry? Mm. He said, this person needed someone to say something very, very firmly. And very, so I put on a show as if I was angry, or I was, <laughs> as if I was upset, because that's what this person needed. But for me to lose my cool, right? Never. And we know the great story of, of Hillel, where there were, there were these two individuals who had a bet for 400 gold coins, whether or not they can irritate Hillel. One said, nah, it's not going to happen. And the other said, yeah, I can, I can make Hillel angry enough where he'll lose his cool. And he meets Hillel at the most stressful time of the week. When is that? Before a few minutes before Shabbos. Right? He's in the shower. And he walks around the area where we, it used to be a public shower then. Right? It used to be like a bathhouse. And he's walking around outside the bathhouse where he knew Hillel was in. And he says, uh, Hillel! Hillel! Any, anybody know Hillel? And he hears, so he hears someone, someone calling him. So he comes out and he says, Yes, my son, how can I help you? He says, are you, are you Hillel? He says, yes. Is there something that... And he asks him a whole set of, of, of irrelevant questions. You know, like, why do the Africans have large feet? Right? Uh, this was a question he asked. He also, right? And he answered him. He explained to him that the, the terrain that you have in, in Africa is such that there's a lot of quicksand. So God gave a special blessing to the people of Africa that they have large legs so they don't sink. Right? So they have larger feet so that they don't sink into the, into the quicksand. And then he left and, and, and then he did the same thing again numerous times, each time asking why do the people of the, why do the people from the, the, from the um, Middle Eastern countries have an egg-shaped head? Why do people from the Far East have, have you know, <laughs> the, the squinted eyes? And so on and so forth. He was asking all these questions and he'll answer every one of his questions with patience every time he came out of the shower. Imagine every single time. Oh, okay, can you, drive, can, can you stop already, right? No, that's not the way he'll ask. Because, again, when we use a soft tone, what the Ramban is telling us, when we speak calmly, when we speak in a soft tone, that's already a measure that keeps us away. It keeps us calculating the words we're going to use. It keeps us calm, right, from losing it. This will prevent you from anger, a serious character flaw which causes people to sin. Okay, so once a person gets to anger, boom, it starts the chain, right? It starts the chain of one sin to another sin, etc., etc. As our rabbi said in the Talmud, Whoever flares up in anger is subject to the discipline of Gehinnom, as it is as it is said in Kohelet. Cast out anger from your heart, and by doing this, remove evil from your flesh. Take away anger, right? Because anger is an illness. Anger is not just a deficiency, okay, of character. It is an illness. 
And when a person is able to remove that anger, he's removing his addiction to something, letting out his frustration through anger. All right, that's not a good thing. Okay. Remove evil from your flesh. Evil here means Gehenom. Right? As we mentioned purgatory, we spoke about this back in the beginning of Breakneck. We spoke about what that means. Anybody remember? Could you repeat it, please? What? Could we can go into it. All right? But we said that Gehenom... It, very good. It's yes. the power wash. Right? Or it's the, the power wash. Way. Why were we brought into this world? Not to suffer. We were brought into this world for pleasure. But we were brought in for authentic pleasure, not for fake pleasure. Now, what's if we got caught up in this world and ran after all of the fake pleasures that there are in this world? So what we did was is we sort of contaminated <coughs> our soul. Right? We got it dirty. We got it full of impurities. So how are we going to clean that? Mm-hmm. So for that, we have Gehenom. Gehenom is not a permanent state like the other religions believe that it's, it's, it's eternal damnation. Right? It is a, a limited amount of time in which that time the soul is, uh, let's call it, uh, uh, refreshed okay, and brought to its original holy state. Right? So that, that was the, the main idea that we, when we spoke about Gehinom, right? It's not a pleasant place, but not a bad place. It's not, it's not a bad place, essentially. It's, a, it's an unfortunate place. Uh, power wash, right, that we, a, a soul needs to go through in order to bask in the holiness of God's presence. Okay. Um, it's like a power wash for the soul. It cleans away all impurities and imperfections. The purpose of this world is to accomplish perfection of our soul. If we fall short of that task, we either have, uh, we either have this power wash Alternatively, we, we can be reincarnated. We spoke about reincarnation, right? Uh, where we return to this world to repair what wasn't complete in a previous life. In which case, we won't undergo the power wash cleansing. Right? Not either a pleasant situation because we don't come back in this form, in this body. We don't come back in any of these uh, realities that we're in right now. Right? Any questions so far? No way in Midrash does it say power wash. No. <laughs> I don't think so. Okay, and the, and the wicked are, uh, so we said uh, evil here means Gehinom, as we, re, as, as we read in Mishle, and the wicked are destined to the day, for the day of evil. Once you have distanced yourself from anger, the quality of humility will enter your heart. And it's very interesting how this, this transition goes about person. Right? How it... it overcomes us in such a beautiful way. And it's very interesting that if we look at the at the introduction to the masterpiece by Ramchal, Ramchal is Reb Moshe Lotzato, he wrote the, the, the book called yeah, The Way of it. God. The Way of God, that's one of, them. Yeah. one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Path, yeah. Yeah. The Path of the, path of the Just. Path of the just. Mm-hmm. Right. And in the introduction yeah, he, he brings a Talmud a quote from the Talmud, where it says that that uh, one of the sages had his path for growth, had his path to perfection, okay, and it was a whole process from uh, from watchfulness to zurizut, right, to, to to alacrity and so on. Each one of the the, the steps, straight all the way till Ruach Hakodesh, which is divine inspiration. All the way to you know almost perfect connection with the Almighty. We're removing all those layers of of separation between us and God. My grandfather said many times that every person has their own route. Okay, R O U T E, their own route. Okay, uh, to to achieving their perfection. Right. None is it. No one has a, a way that's a contradiction. Right to another person's way, right? Everyone has their own unique way, their own perfect way. This is the Ramban here spelling out his method, his path, all right? Starts with, speak calmly. Speak in a soft tone. <clears throat> that, what will that do? That would eliminate anger. And instead of it, what will it do? It'll bring about humility, okay? 
the quality of humility will enter your heart. This radiant quality is the finest of all admirable traits. Following humility comes the fear of Hashem. Boom, we see step number three now. Right? What's step number three? So it comes from speaking calmly, humility, fear of Hashem. Now, why does humility lead to fear of Hashem? Now, it's interesting. What is, what is, who is the closest person to God? Moshe. Moshe. Moses, right? What was the quality that identified Moses? Humility. Humility, as we'll see in class number 862 of Breakneck, right? <laughs> what? In year 2036. <laughs> exactly. Um, right, so what, what identified Moses in his uniqueness was humility. Why? Because humility and fear of God go hand in hand. It is impossible for a person to be arrogant and have the presence of God yeah, upon sense. him. It's sense. impossible. Yeah. Why? Arrogance. What is arrogance? Arrogance is me, me, me. Yeah, What's humility? It's not me. Exactly. Right? It's someone else. Mm -hmm. What rights do I have to take credit for something I didn't earn? Right? Uh, I'm, I'm so brilliant. Guess what? Who gave me those brains? Right. The Almighty. Right? I'm so... Uh, I, you know, it's like we say in 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 in, uh, in Eshet Chayel, right? The beautiful song that we sing every Shabbos evening, right? It's interesting that we sing right after we we sing uh, for the angels, the angels who escort or escort the Shabbos queen. Okay, as soon as the, the, the we bring the Shabbos queen into our home. And we tell the angels, okay, now you can go. The queen is here. Everything is taken care of. The table is set. Right? Now, you can go. Go in peace. But then, we remind the woman of our home, right? You're the queen of this house. Right? So we sing immediately, we sing it for the woman of the home. And if your husband doesn't sing it for you, tell him to learn it. All right? You deserve for your for your husband to sing it for you. You hear that, David? One of the things, one of the fascinating <laughs> phrases that King Solomon says in chapter 30, 31 of, of uh, Proverbs, and that's where Eshet Chayel comes from, he says the following, Sheker hachein vehevel hayofi, isha yirat Hashem hiti talal. Sheker hachein means? False. False is beauty. Vehevel Yofi, in vain, is, 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 uh, was like, Sheker HaChem, false, is, uh, is, uh, um, uh, grace, grace all right, and, Vehevel, one second, Vehevel Yofi, and futile, and vanity, is the, um, beauty. is the beauty. Isha Yirat Hashem, he titalam. A God-fearing woman, she's praiseworthy. All right. So I once heard a beautiful idea to explain this verse because it really doesn't make that much sense, right? I like we try to understand how does how does this? So I heard I heard this from 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 a great a great sage. He said the following: What does a person do to have grace or beauty? Nothing. Zero. Nothing. Right. <laughs> right. You did nothing to earn it. God decided to give you beauty. You have beauty. Decided. God decided to give you grace. You have grace. True. Right, so that's vanity. That's that's vain. That's that's futile. It's, it's pointless true. praising someone's beauty. They did nothing for it. But yirat Hashem, fear of God. The Talmud tells us that the only thing that we have the ability to work on is our fear of God. So fear of God is an accomplishment. Fear of God is praiseworthy. That is something that we should praise. You can praise someone's car. What did he do? Nothing. Right? You say, ah, oh, nice car. Right? Uh, really? What did he do to, to, to have a nice car? The more we have a clarity of our relationship with God, right, the reality of fear kicks in. Right? Because, one second, if God gives me everything I have, and he can take it in a second. Right. That's right? your fear. It's, it's fear. If God gives me all the oxygen I'm going to breathe through my entire life, and in one split here of a second, 
it can all, all end. Power off, done. Right? It's, it's very terrifying. So if we live in a, in a reality where God is in the center of our lives, then yeah, we live with, with a certain element of fear. My grandfather, every single day, left his house as if it was the last time he was going to leave the house. He lived that day of death for the, probably the last 40 or 50 years <clears throat> of his life. Right? Every day, he was ready to go. Right? It's, and it's interesting. The Mishnah says that that's the way we should live. It's, right? Every day should be like the day before you die because you never know when you're going to die. Right? So never say, oh, I'll take care of that debt yeah. next month. I'll take care of that apology in three weeks. Yeah. Right? When I see them next. No, don't wait to take care of things. Take, up, take care of it immediately because you don't know when that last moment is going to be. Right? Fear of Hashem means that I have a connection to Hashem. Right? When we have something from God as a gift, we don't have a right to boast about it. Now let's connect that to Moses. Here's Moses. He's the leader of the Jewish people. He took them out of Egypt. He brought upon the Egyptians ten plagues, which the, which the Talmud tells us ended up being 250 plagues. Right? He goes up to the mountain. He's the chosen one to go up the mountain to receive the actual tablets. To break the tablets, God says, good job. And all of these amazing things that happen to him, he has a lot that he can, right, pound his chest and say, ah, oh, I'm Moses. I'm the, and we see that he was just the opposite. He's like, me, I, I'm nothing. I, I, I'm just, right, I, I'm, I'm like sand. I'm nothing. Where does he get this humility from? Because the closer you are to God, the more you realize how insignificant you are. Right? The more you're closer to the fire, the more you realize how hot it is. Right? The closer we are, we think we're so great in this in this planet Earth, right? We can build a big palace, we can build a kingdom, we can right? You get a little bit closer to the sun, you see we start burning up like a like a little like, you know. We see the majesty, we see the greatness, the the, the holier and, and the more elevated we become, the closer we are to God, the smaller we realize we are. So does God want us to live in fear of Him? God wants us to live with a steady consciousness of Him. So there, there, are, there are actually several terminologies that are used. There's Ema and there's Yira. Ema is the awe. So when you see the grandeur of God, you see the, the lightning and the thundering and you see the, the, the majesty so that's, that puts you in awe. But Fear, when we talk about fear, it does not mean fear like you're sitting in the corner under a table, you know, shivering because you're terrified. Right? Your, and it's, your comment about your grandfather every day of his life, he walked out and knowing right. that maybe this is his last day. I couldn't live that way. I'm not, Wouldn't that make you paranoid? Well, that's another Mass term. But I, no, 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 no. He didn't, he, but if you met him, he was a happy person. He was, well, but the he, was, he was living every minute of life <laughs> as if it was the last minute, enjoying it. Yes. I, I wanted to just mention something. My, my grandfather also had something similar, but he would, every day he would look at the obituaries in the newspaper. Oh. And when he didn't see himself in there, he said it's going to be a good day. He was day. happy. <laughs> 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 it's, it's the same thing, you know. Yeah. And, and he'd go out and live a happy day. It's, it's, the Talmud, the Talmud in Gittin says a beautiful idea on the word fear. It says fear of God doesn't mean fear of God. It means fear of losing opportunities. Fear of losing, losing the chance of maximizing our potential. That means it's supposed to be an energizer, not a limiter. And I've shared this before, that I had the opportunity to, uh, to spend time with my grandmother on my most recent trip to Israel in which she, I asked her, what was the environment in her home growing up? Right? She grew up in Lithuania. So she said, my father always told us to remember how big a human being is. In, in the terms of Musa, it's called Gadluta Adam, the greatness of man. We get so petty about such small things we get carried away with food, we get carried away with fashion, we get carried away with entertainment, we get carried away with all these small things, forgetting how awesome and how great a human being is. We can accomplish anything in the world. 
and we yet we get carried away with little little minutia, with little arguments and you know finger pointing at other people, and it becomes like a whole big. Uh, Magilla. Yeah, huh. when it's not necessary, when it's not necessary. So to keep that in mind, to focus on the big things. We're huge as human beings. We're, we can com- accomplish so much. And, and again, not to knock ourselves that we should live every day like we're going to die. But again, to recognize we have so much potential. <clears throat> we have so much potential. We can do so much. Right? If we just focused on, let's accomplish more. Let's do more. Okay. Through humility, uh, through humility, you will also come to fear Hashem. It will, this is the second paragraph. It will cause you to always think about where you came from and where you are going and that while alive you are only like a maggot and a worm and the same after death. It will also remind you before whom you will be judged, the King of Glory, as it is stated, even the heavens and even the heavens and the heavens of heavens can't contain you, referring to the Almighty. Right? How much less the hearts of people. Right? If all of the heavens of heavens can't contain the Almighty, can't understand and grasp the greatness of the Almighty, of course the heart of man, which is significantly smaller than the heavens of heavens, can't grasp and understand the enormity of God. It is also written do I not fill heaven and earth, says Hashem? It means Hashem encompasses everything. Hashem is everywhere. Right? My son was telling me that God isn't in the car. Because God can't be in the car. God is every place. You can't limit him just to the car. Right? He's everywhere. Right? It's like, God is in my hand. Right? But he's not only in my hand. He's everywhere. God is everywhere. It's like the song when, 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 our, when our, our children are growing up. It's Hashem is here. Hashem is yeah. there. Hashem is truly mm-hmm. everywhere. Right? Up, up, down, down, right, left, all around. Right? You know the song. But the idea that, that God is really everywhere. Right? Which, by the way, the more we allow God into our lives, the more we'll see God in our lives. Mm-hmm. The more we remove God from our lives, the more everything will just look like it just happened. It's happenstance, right? There, there are. I once heard uh, someone say um, that there, someone whose whose mother was was in an, in an accident, so they were of the belief. I guess it was a sort of a way for them to comfort themselves that it was happenstance. It happened to be she was at the wrong place at the wrong time. She was in this car accident, and therefore she died, right? But that's not the way a true believer yeah. believes, right? We don't believe that it just happened to be mm-hmm. they were at the wrong place at the wrong time. That's exactly where God predestined them to be. And unfortunately, right, we don't understand the ways of Hashem. We don't understand why God decided that He wanted this holy soul back at this early stage in life, right? We, we'll never know that answer. But it doesn't mean that God wasn't there. It's an awful thing to think that God... Just let them, whatever will be, will be. Oh, you're wrong place, sorry. Right? I think it's a much more comforting, comforting thought to say, you know what? This was a special person and God wanted this person back. Mm-hmm. Right? Okay, you know, it's never, it's never easy. We should, again, we should never know about these, such, 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 such pain and sorrow. Third paragraph. When you think about all these things, you will come to fear Hashem who created you and you will protect yourself from sinning and therefore, be happy with whatever happens to you. So now we get to a point of happiness. Right? When you realize that really nothing is coming to me. Really I don't deserve anything. Whatever God gives me now is a treat. Wow, I can move my hands. I can, I can, I can even punch him in the air. I can dance. I can, I can yell. I can sing. Right? I, I, can, I can go on the floor and crawl with my kids and play games. Right? Ah! Oh, what a gift. Everything we start appreciating. Right? And you will protect yourself from sinning. Um, and you will protect yourself from sinning and therefore be happy with whatever happens to you. Also, when you act humbly and modestly before everyone and are afraid of Hashem and of sin, the radiance of His glory and the spirit of the Shekhinah will rest upon you. That's after happiness. What's that? That's after happiness. Yes. So you'll have the you'll have the radiance of his glory and the spirit of his shechina will rest upon you, 
and you will live a life, the life of the world to come. It's very interesting. You will live the life of the world to come. Where are you going to live the life of the world to come? On this floor. Right here. The life of ultimate pleasures, right? What do we say about Shabbat? What is Shabbat? Shabbat is called a day. Me'en olam haba. It's a, a taste. Just a, It says that Shabbat is the 60th of the world to come. The pleasure of Shabbat, the pleasure of nothing to worry about. Everything is taken care of. Absolute connection with your family and with, with the Almighty and with, you know, sleeping on Shabbos. It says there's no sleep like the sleep on Shabbos. <laughs> right? Oh, it's just so holy. Right? <laughs> Shabbos afternoon, you take a nap. Oh, right? The best thing ever. Right? Even Friday night. I do it every Friday it's, it's, afternoon. It's just... So, living the world every day here as if it's the world to come. We can do that. Again, it, it's a process. We don't get angry. We don't carry, get carried away with small things. We focus on God. We focus on our purpose in this world. We focus on our potential. We focus on all of the unbelievable achievements that we can accomplish in our lifetime. Right? Again, we need a positive outlook in our life, not a negative one. Right? Not one which is like, look, I did nothing with my life. Right? I wasted away another day. No, God forbid. Right? Just the opposite. Today's another day. It's another opportunity. It's another beginning. Right? Every day, that's the way we should start off our day. It's another opportunity. My name is not in the obituary. It's a great day. Right? It's a great day. Right? I have life. I can accomplish. I wanted to also just kind of say one sure, more thing. Sure, sure, sure. Um, it was also interesting, you know, about being humble. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean just being meek and not doing anything. Like you're saying, and, and my grandfather also said, I mean, I remember his 50th wedding anniversary, he got up and he said, you know, people have asked me what has made my marriage so good after 50 years. He says, well, we made an arrangement in the very beginning when we got married that she would take care of all the little things and I would take care of all the big things and so far after 50 years, nothing big has ever come up. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, having that humility, even though, you know, it wasn't like well, she took care of everything. <laughs> so I'll tell you that they say a story about Rabbi Yisrael Salanter that Rabbi Yisrael Salanter um, made an agreement with his wife that all spiritual matters I think, I think this was it all spiritual matters he'll handle well, physical matters she'll handle, right? So he said the only thing they were left to argue about was whether or not it was spiritual or material. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, fourth paragraph. And now, my son, understand and observe that whoever feels that he is greater than others is rebelling against the kingship of Hashem. Because he is adorning himself with his garments, meaning capital H, with Hashem's mm-hmm. garments. As it is written, Hashem reigns, he wears clothes of pride. Why should one feel proud? Is it because of wealth? Hashem makes one poor or rich. Is it because of honor? It belongs to Hashem. As we read, wealth and honor comes from you. So how could one adorn himself with Hashem's honor? And one who is proud of his wisdom surely knows that Hashem takes away the speech of assured men and reasoning from the sages. So we see that everyone is the same before Hashem. Since with his anger he lowers, his, lowers the proud and when he wishes he raises the low. So lower yourself and Hashem will lift you up. How many people do we know who be, have become very, very successful in business. Many. And at some state, they were in abject poverty. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Everybody we know who's made it was once poor. In po- well, was once poor. Mm-hmm. Right? Who made it, by the way, financially. It doesn't mean they made it in life. It doesn't right. mean they're successful. Someone who drives a nice car and wears nice clothes does not mean they're successful. Just let's 
redefine the terms here. It's a good start. What? <laughs> spoken let, like, don't spoken start. like a true Persian. <laughs> don't, let, don't let Hashem hear you. <laughs> that is not success. That is not success. Mm-hmm. Someone who's a good father, that's success. Someone who's connected to the Almighty, that's success. Someone who's maximizing life, who's maximizing the, their potential, that is success. Okay, so let, let's not get too, too carried away in that. What does it mean when someone is arrogant? When someone is, uh, like he says over here, greater than others? Mm-hmm. That's what they think of themselves. That means Narcissism. that they're yes. using other people as the measuring stick to how good they are. Yeah, right. That is an awful way to, to, to evaluate your own spirituality. I didn't get angry. They got angry. Look how good I am. Guess what? For you, that may not have been a challenge. For them, it is a challenge. Right? You know, if we're using other people as the barometer for our success to determine whether or not we are successful, it's the wrong measuring stick. Right? That means our eyes are in the wrong place. That's why it's rebelling against the Almighty. Because the measuring stick is God. The measuring stick is not other people. Right? So if I'm using other people as my barometer as to whether or not I'm high enough or I've grown enough, I'm in the wrong place. Right? I should not be using other people as my measuring stick. I should be using the Almighty. Right? So if you're ever in a challenge and you know want to know what is the right thing to do don't ask yourself what will my friends say mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. ask yourself what does god want me to do right what does god want me to do okay now we as we mentioned earlier we already uh, uh, touched on this point that we have no right to take pride in anything only our accomplishments. But what type of accomplishments? We, we see the accomplishment of wisdom is not an accomplishment. Oh, you're so smart. You got 150, uh, 150 times better than anybody else in your class. Guess what? God gave you brains and thank God you're using it. Don't think you're, you're greater than anyone. Wealth, right? Wealth. Who gives wealth and who takes wealth? God, right? I, I, I met with someone not long ago. He tells me, nobody helped me become successful. I did it myself. Okay, arrogance is one of his issues. Okay, but right, I did it myself. So I asked. I said, "Tell me, what is your business?" He says, "I do such and such." I said, "Who decided that your clients should buy from you? Don't you have competitors?" He said, "Yeah." I said, "So maybe they should go to your competitor." Would you think because you're so good looking, and therefore they're coming to you? I said, "No." It's that God directed them to you. Mm-hmm. Right? I never thought about that. Mm-hmm. That's true. Right? No one decided that you're going to be successful other than the Almighty. Mm-hmm. Success doesn't come because He knows how to structure His business well. Success comes because God sends a person success. Right? You have a competitor who does exactly the same thing. Why didn't they get the business that you got? Not because you're more aggressive. Not because you have better salespeople, because God wants you to succeed. So God sends you the success. Yeah. Right? Papa, yes. We also have to ask. Oh, we is. have to do Hishtadlut. That's yeah. true. Hishtadlut is the key to all success. Right? And, but it doesn't mean that because I gave my effort, right? Hishtadlut means effort. Right? I, you have to go and give your effort. You have to try to make the sale. Mm-hmm. But again, the clinch, okay, the final sale doesn't come because of your smart. No, but we okay? pray for that. Pray of course we pray for it. And God can and sometimes Amidah. say yes, and God could sometimes yeah. say no. Right? How many people do we know that run the same exact business? One person is extremely successful, and the other person is extremely not successful. Right? There's no, there's no, sometimes we feel there's no rhyme or reason, because we don't see a full picture. We only see what's in front of us. Okay. Was there a hand up? Someone was asking. Something. Okay. Because so, uh, if you extend the same idea, it's like if you're an employer, you're not going to go hire just anybody that comes along and say, "Well, if Hashem wants wants me to be successful, I'll be successful." You try to hire someone who right, is right, but Hashem uh, also sometimes sends us signals to tell us this is not the good guy to hire. Sometimes is right. Sometimes 
um, people get into relationships, marriages, and they say, I don't know how I fell into the trap, right? And at many times they say, you know what? I remember back when I was dating, she said something and it bothered me, and I pushed it aside because there was something else that was over, you know, there was an attraction, there was, you know, they, so they didn't listen to the message. God sent them a clear message, and they didn't listen to it. So what do you want? Right? Now, that, that, that may not be the reason. It could be that it was the right, the right shidduch, right? And it just didn't work out for other reasons, right? But it, it's, uh, a person needs... It could be Yad Kikon. It, it. it could also be Yad Kikon, right? <laughs> it could be... Uh, Tikkun means your, 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 your uh, life's perfection. Meaning, mm -hmm. you, sometimes we need to go through certain things to cleanse us in this world. Sometimes a, a miserable marriage is, 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 is part of that. Mm -hmm. But I don't believe that any marriage needs to be miserable. I really am not a believer in a miserable marriage. I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that every marriage could be um, worked on and could be uh, successful. But not, not doesn't mean every single one could be successful, but it can become, it doesn't have to be hostile. Right. Um, it's certainly not not uh, what marriage should be like. Marriage should be bliss. It should be like Gan Eden, right? Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. We say in our blessings, we say Me Gan Eden Me Kedem. One of the blessings that we say under the Chuppah is that we say that this marriage should be like Gan Eden. Mm -hmm. One second, and, and we know that in the Garden of Eden, uh, Adam and Eve didn't have to do anything. Right? Everything was there for them. So you're telling this couple now that everything is going to be taken care of. So remember we mentioned that there are two Garden of Edens, remember? Yeah. There's a physical Garden of Eden and a spiritual, a one, one, one up in heaven, right? The one in this world, the physical one, you need to work, you need to toil. You'll get good products if you work on it, right? <coughs> you're saying, yes, it could be like the Garden of Eden if you put in the appropriate work, right? And work does not mean... Well, if my wife listened to me and she cooked dinner on time and she this and she that, then the marriage will be perfect. No, it is it's it's a it's a a hundred percent work on each one of the spouses. Agreed. Okay, a hundred percent effort needs to be put by each one of them in order for it to be bliss. Therefore, says the Rambam, I will now explain to you how to always behave humbly. Speak gently at all times, with your head bowed, your eyes looking down to the ground, and your heart focusing on Hashem. Don't look at the face of a person to whom you are speaking. Consider everyone as greater than yourself. Now, this is not talking literal. Yeah. Let's. I'll give you. An, I'll give you an explanation in a second. Consider everyone as greater than yourself. If he is wise or rich, you should give him respect. If he is poor and you are richer or wiser than he, consider yourself to be more guilty than he, and that he is more worthy than you, since when he sins, it is an error, while yours is deliberate, and you should know better. Wow. Okay? That means I'm smarter than he is, yeah. right? So that means That's I'm more obligated. Yeah. My grandfather writes a letter about this in one of his books. He says the challenge that he has is going to be a very different challenge than what I have. Because for me, I need to review it and review it and review it to gain a clarity. But for him, one time, boom, he's got it. Store it. True. But then the details, who knows the better details? The one who's reviewed it and reviewed it. Right? Someone else who has such a strong brain power, right? Or su such, a, su such an intelligence um, may gloss over it. So he knows it, but he doesn't know the greater details of it. So you're getting a quality versus a quantity. But then on the other hand, is an obligation that he's put into it, where he better know. It means when we come to the heavenly courts, God's not going to ask me, or I hope he doesn't, why don't you know the Talmud inside out? Right? But to someone who has such wisdom, right, you better know all of Talmud inside out. Right? Everything, because that's why I gave it to you. I gave you the wisdom so that you produce more. Don't produce average. But he has to be more humble. True. Yeah, he has to remember constantly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that it's a gift from the Almighty. Mm -hmm. And the humility is the key component. Whenever a person is skilled in any area, they need to constantly remind themselves, caution, this is just a gift. This is just a gift. It's not mine to keep. 
It's not mine forever, and it's not mine. I did nothing to earn it. It's a gift from God. I need to treasure it. I need to have joy that I have this gift, but not to take pride over it as if I did something. I'm some genius that I figured out, you know, the keys to, right, to, to wisdom or the keys to beauty. He's saying that when you're when you're criticizing someone, mm -hmm. when you're criticizing someone, don't criticize them to their face, right? right? Hey. You know what you did wrong, right? Instead, you know, when you're talking in a soft voice, it's not, it's not my place. I shouldn't be telling you this. It's it's very different than accusatory. It's an accusatory way, you know, you know, having a direct context. So when you're when you're criticizing someone, you're trying to help someone grow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It should be with the, with a humble. I'm not worthy of telling you. It's not my place. I'm sorry. You know, it sh it sh I, it don't be a, don't be upset at me when I tell you this, right? It's like. So have that humility where you don't feel like, hey, I'm better than you. Okay. I'm not better. I'm not worthy of telling you this. Okay. Right? I'm just telling you to because I love you, because I care about you, because, right? And that's why I'm... Okay. Hey, Rabbi, but if you... Yes. If you look down and you don't look at somebody... <laughs> We're not you, talking about when I'm talking to you as just as a friend. Right. Okay. But you, won't tr you can't believe that. Right. But if I go to you and I say, hey, David, listen. You're making a mistake. You're doing the wrong thing, right? Okay. And you take it very personal. Get defensive. Yeah. But if yeah. I tell you, you know, you know, maybe you yeah. should reevaluate how you do things, right? It's different because I'm not accusing you, and I'm not attacking you, and that's what he's saying. He's saying have you're a humility you're look, you're in not. all your actions, words, and thoughts. Always regard yourself as standing before Hashem, and His shina, His presence above you, for His glory fills the whole world. Speak with fear and awe as a slave stands before his master. Act with restraint in front of everyone. Again, because it's not, we're, don't think that we're parallels. We're not parallels. We're each uniquely connected to the Almighty. Right? My grandfather, I heard him, he said once in one of his, his, his discourses, he said, the miracle of this world is that each one of us are our own universe. And the miracle is that we can intercommunicate between these universes. I have my own world right over here. It's my little bubble, right? <laughs> and people say, you're in a little bubble, right? You bet you're a little bubble, right? Every person is a little bubble. But the fact that we can intercommunicate between those bubbles and between those universes, and we can help one another, and we can share ideas, and we can help other people grow, right? That is the beauty of this world. That's the miracle that every single day we thank the Almighty for. That God recreates the world, each world, each one of our worlds within, with, with, within this enormous uh, universe. Speak with fear and awe as a slave stands before his master. Act with restraint in front of everyone. When someone calls you, don't answer loudly, but gently and softly as one who stands before his master. Torah should always be learned diligently so you will be able to fulfill its commands. You know, there's a story about Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva got married. When he was 40 years old, he was in absolute ignoramus. He didn't know anything. And his wife married him and said, I want you to go to yeshiva. Yeshiva is not the same thing as it is today. Yeshiva is very, very different back then. Yeshiva, you went, you came back 10 years later. Mm -hmm. You stayed there. Right? You stayed there. You stayed there and you lived there and it was, you were locked in the zone. He was there 12 years. And as he's coming back, he overhears the neighbor talking to his wife saying, Huh, your husband, what, what kind of love does he have for you? Right? Twelve years he leaves you. Twelve years. He overhears this conversation. And he hears his wife say, I love him so much, right, that I would send him back for another twelve years. And he turned around and went back. And of course everyone asks, go inside, have a coffee, have a piece of cake, right? And, and then go. Go inside, say hello. Give her a hug and a kiss, something. No. Imagine you have a cup of boiling water. 
You need to boil it for 10 minutes. So you take it for 5 minutes, take it off the fire, and then, you know, for 10 minutes, and then put it back on for another 5 minutes. Is it the same? Mm-hmm. It gets boiling, but it's not like 10 minutes. The learning of continuity, of consistency, is greater than having piecemeal. Right? When he says here, Torah should be learned diligently, that means if a person dedicates time for learning, so if the person is going to learn this week's Torah portion, that means that I'm learning for this hour and only learning. I'm not going to look at my phone and I'm not going to talk to a friend and I'm not going to pick up a voice me- message or, or send an email because as soon my grandfather writes this in the beginning of his, of, his, of his book, he says, as soon as you open up the Talmud, as soon as you open up the book, suddenly the world of imagination comes to your mind. You're thinking about Spain, your next vacation. Maybe should I take a cruise? I don't know. I don't know. You suddenly start thinking about the entire world, everything but the page of Talmud that you're learning. Right? It takes a lot of a lot of attention to ensure that we're diligent in our learning, that we're focused in our learning, Is not that to stop. Oh, well, you bet. The Yetzirah, there's nothing more that the Yetzirah hates than learning Torah. There's nothing more. That's why I congratulate you all for coming here tonight. <laughs> There's nothing that the Yetzahara dislikes more than people learning Torah. Right? That's why I'm sure every single one of you tonight, before you left your house, you had this thought. <laughs> Tell me if I'm wrong. Maybe I should just stay home. No, I haven't made no, it yet. wrong. I didn't what? think that. I haven't got home yet. You didn't get home yet. Right? <laughs> <laughs> should I maybe just go home to eat dinner? Right? No. So maybe I should just... And, and like these thoughts creep into our minds, saying, you know, maybe just... One week, if I take a break, it's not so bad. Right? The rabbi won't even notice if I'm not there. I notice whoever's not here, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I know you know. Maybe you'll notice. No, I didn't think Torah that. should always be learned diligently, so you will be able to fulfill its commands. When you arise from your learning, reflect carefully on what you have studied in order to see what in it that you can put into practice. Examine your actions every morning and evening, and in this way, every one of your days will be spent in Teshuvah. Again, what does Teshuvah mean? We, we spoke about this. What is repentance? Repentance means the clarity. It means I have a clear understanding of what's right and what's wrong. Right? A person who's Shav, a person who returns, meaning they're returning to an absolute connection with the Almighty. Right? Our soul... In, in, a, in, a, in an image that can help us understand, is sort of a, a part of God. Now, God doesn't have pieces, so He can give us a part of Him, right? But it's for us to understand this concept, okay? It's like a part of God. It's infused by God. Inspired by God. That soul can lose its connection from God the more we distance ourselves, we get caught up with all the small, the minutia, the, 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 like we said, all the small things in life. We get caught up in food, we get caught up in, in fashion, we get caught up in, in materialism. We get These things distance us from God. So the more we have God in our lives, the more we live with tshuva. But Rabbi, can we balance both? Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't mean that we don't yeah, live a, a good life. That doesn't mean, on the contrary, that means we're living the highest quality of life. Right? We we talk about this a lot about living and living a a um, an authentic, pleasurable life. Right? That doesn't mean that you don't enjoy time with your family. It doesn't mean that you don't enjoy food. It doesn't mean that you don't enjoy a good vacation. It doesn't mean that on the contrary, you learn to enjoy it much more because you appreciate it, right? Using the bathroom, right? We make a blessing, thanking mm-hmm. God that our body mm-hmm. works. Mm-hmm. Imagine the pain that one, eh, what's the big deal? Okay, so you don't go for a day. No, we take it for granted. We know what pain that is, right? He was turning over like a, like a hot dog on, on, a, on, a, on a roller. He was in such pain, right? Thank God. 
they were able to, to, to help help him feel better. Right? But we learned to appreciate it. one yeah. second, right? Yeah. So we hurt our leg, we hurt our mm -hmm. foot, we you know, someone who has back pain, someone we learn to appreciate every single second of life. On the contrary, we live a more conscious life mm -hmm. when we live like this. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's not that we're living in fear, we're living... No! We're living in joy! Right? We're living with, with, with delight every minute. And appreciation. Rabbi. That's right. Appreciation. Concentrate on your prayers by removing all worldly concerns from your heart. Prepare your heart before Hashem. Purify your thoughts and think about what you are going to say. If you follow this in all your daily actions, you will not come to sin. It's a promise the Ramban is giving. You will not come to sin. This way, everything you do will be proper, and your prayer will be pure, clear, clean, devout, and acceptable to Hashem. As it is written, when their heart is direct to you, I listen to them. Okay. Remember this letter at least once a week, and neglect none of it. Fulfill it, and in, doing, in, and in so doing, walk with it forever in the ways of Hashem. Hashem, may he be blessed, so that you will succeed in all your ways. Thus you will succeed in the merit and merit the world to come, which lies hidden away for the righteous. Every day that you shall read this letter, heaven shall answer your heart's desires. Amen. Now let me tell you something. I went to my rabbi many, many years ago. Um, of blessed memory. My, my rabbi passed away about 10 years ago and um, I asked him maybe this is 15 years ago 17 years ago a humble man like you've never seen what was his name? Rev. Beryl Eisenstein Zechat Tzadik Lebracha but I said to him one time I said I feel like I have an arrogance I feel like I need to humble myself more so he told me to read this every day for a month he said, read this every day for a month. You won't have arrogance anymore. Right? So, it's, it's a lifetime's work. Right? But it's a good tool. It's a very good tool to learn, to overcome. Because what, you do, what it does is it right away puts you in the zone to remember, hey, who am I? Why am I here? What's the purpose of life? What's the purpose of my existence? Right? To connect to Hashem. And if I have that presence right here, it's pointless for me to think of me as being better than someone else, accomplishing more than someone else. Uh, you know, oh, I'm, 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 I'm holier than someone else, I'm wealthier than someone else, I'm smarter than someone else, I'm prettier than someone else. It's all <coughs> irrelevant because the barometer is not other people. Mm -hmm. The barometer is what God gave me and what God expects me to accomplish. Right? So it's taking away all the clutter of life and really giving us a focus. One second, God expects this from me, right? I need to work in taking my step in elevating myself. How hard did you say it was to, to um, correct a negative trait? Very, very hard. It's very, wouldn't very hard. The like arrogance would be one of the hardest ones, wouldn't it? True, but again, as, as soon as we're able to understand that arrogance is a result of not having a clear faith in the Almighty... Right? So then it's not as difficult because if we're taking what trait and hitting it straight on, it's going to be very difficult. But there are many other ways that we can get around it. right? So we can work on our faith in God and then we're not working on our arrogance per se. We're working on our understanding and connection to God. So we're, we're so using a different tool. Everyone's happy? Everyone's good? Yeah, Excellent. Thank you all for coming.